Hello and welcome to this review of my Olympia typewriter module. And of an AEK2 on the side. Haha, <laughs> you didn't count on that, did you? Both of these are donations, and both of them come with Mitsumi standard mechanical switches, which is excellent because that finally gives me an opportunity to talk about these. The ones in the AEK2 are the Alps mount tactile version, while the ones in the Olympia are cross mount linear. Interestingly, both of them remind me of Alps switches a little bit. I'm not going to review the whole AEK2 again, as I've already done that twice, but I do want to get into the switches. They strongly remind me of Salmon Alps, although this board is in somewhat sorry condition, so they feel scratchy. But in terms of general feel, it's pretty similar. I'd like it if it weren't so dirty, I think. I mean, I know the board looks clean, but that's just after I clean the case and keycaps, really. The sound is a bit different, though. It's not bad sounding at all, but it's not as bassy as Alp switches. They are a fair bit quieter, but that might also just be the chassis, to be honest. The linear Mitsumis on the Olympia thing, I'm not exactly sure which model this came from, by the way, feel a lot more like yellow Alps, basically kind of medium stiff linears, and they also have a similar slight tactile bump in the key travel that linear Alp switches also have. The reason for this bump is much the same in these Mitsumis as it is for Alps switches. You can see it if I open one of these spare Mitsumi mount tactile versions I've got lying around. Namely, it's got a switch plate. And this contact leaf at the front functions a bit like a weakly tactile leaf spring, which is where that ever so slight tactile bump comes from. The tactility in the tactile switch comes from a unique mechanism that Mitsumi also employed in their miniature switches. It's basically a pre-tensed underslung coil spring that sits above a breaker in the shape of a trapezoid, which inverts the spring when it's pressed down on it. Interestingly, there is no separate return spring present, which means that the tactile element also functions as the return element, which is rather rare in a tactile switch design. I reviewed the miniature switches ages ago, they're among my least favourite switches in existence and its review was one of my first really sweary ones. They use the same underslung coil spring mechanism and actually feel quite good as loose switches, but in a keyboard, even a quite clean one like this, they're just pants plasteringly awful. You can actually hear it binding. <laughs> It's not 100% possible to say with the switches in such bad condition, of course, but the tactile feel is at least still intact. And I think that if they were clean, they'd probably feel a lot better than the miniature switches. I mean, they pretty much already do, despite the difference in condition. Can't be completely sure, though. The linear ones, although also not exactly clean, are a lot less scratchy, which helps cement my previously mentioned suspicions. They don't feel too bad, although I do like my linears lighter than this, to be honest. Still, not bad to type on for a little while, and considering this one isn't even wearing a case, the sound is pretty decent as well. Listen to this. Nice. The cause quickly becomes apparent when you take off a keycap, the pretty thick ABS double shots at 1.7mm, which is a little bit thicker than even OG Cherry double shots, and they're a bit taller too, in fact they're uniprofile. They use Olympia's signature style of keycaps, similar to this Marquardt based one for example, with very sharp angles, in fact they're almost square in appearance, but they have spherical key tops which somehow seems even more unique. They're lovely caps actually, if these had been MX compatible I think people would be all over them. Some interesting quirks include the lettering being in all caps, the presence of both a backspace and a backspace key. I'm assuming one was to erase the input and the other to actually move back a space, which would mean that this was a model of correcting typewriter. And probably the weirdest shaped enter key I've seen to date. Here's what it looks like outside the board. I mean, what in crikey fuck is this thing? Absolute unit too. Here's what it looks like compared to a big ass enter key. I mean, look at that. One knows that the retainer's keycap side are loops made out of metal, so they made a very loud rattle sound at first, especially the spacebar. However, a small dab of silicon grease fixed that right up, and now it sounds like pure classy thunk goodness. It's pretty stiff too, it's got an extra external coil spring under it, which is pretty common for vintage keyboards. 
cool little slidey buttons on the left as well, presumably for setting line spacing, type thickness and margin or font size or something. Always fun to play with. The module, or really just the assembly, weighs about 800 grams, which isn't bad considering there's no case or anything. Indeed, with its thick metal mounting plate, it'd probably make a decent toughie. It comes with two ribbon cables too, so who knows, it might be a good contender for a custom project or something. Considering this thing is from 1984, or so I've been told, let alone the fact that it isn't even a keyboard, technically speaking, the layout is surprisingly normal. If you rebind this key to control and this one to alt, and make both of these actual backspaces with these keys on the right here as F keys, you could probably easily use it as a daily driver. You could even reappropriate these as rough volume sliders. Overall, I like it, and I like the switches too. I might do a redux if I find either in pristine condition, but disregarding the scratchiness, the type of feeling is pretty solid, I'd say. Nice. That's it for this kinda double review. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, and following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.